All right, it is my good pleasure to be meeting with my good friends, Linda Glass and Jeff Mercer, who are, I think, really exemplary collectors, though they would say that they are nowhere near as aggressive as some other collectors we've spoken to in the past. And I suppose that's true, but I think they're passionate and they're sincere. Um, let me ask you first, Linda, did you ever, when, how did you, when did you get interested in art? Well, really and truly, it was at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Uh, awesome. When I was a junior in high school. We went and what, it, was, it was an epiphany. Yeah, it was. It was in front of a Botticelli Adoration of Magi, and there was a lecturer in front of it, and she was describing the iconography and the symbolism in this painting, and I had no idea that there, it could, a painting could communicate that much. It blew me away. And, and that's really it, cool. Yeah. I think that's the best story I've heard. Yeah, I love that one. Jeff, what about you? <laughs> You know, I, I got interested in college. I, uh, I had a roommate who happened to buy an etching. Uh, it was by an artist from the Northeast named Peter Milton. Uh, and it hung in our, we shared an apartment together. It hung in our room. And I started going out to galleries. I guess I had taken an art appreciation course. But I started going to galleries. And it was, uh, a terrific gallery in Washington, D.C. called Franz Bader Gallery. He was a kind of an Austrian first world guy. And I would go in and just look. And I was a student. I didn't have much money. Um, but I would comment on a painting or something or a print. And he would say, you should buy it. And I said, oh, I really can't afford it. He said, oh, of course you can. I'll let you do it in three payments and no interest. And so that's how I bought my first art. I would buy it, bought it from Franz, and I paid it in installments. You know, before I moved to Chicago, I had a gallery in the suburb of San Francisco, and a girl was walking past the gallery. It was a storefront gallery on a small street in the town, and she was on her way to buy a mattress, and she saw a print that I had hanging in the front window, and she came in and said, how much is that? I said, it's $100. She said, Can, will you take $10 a month for it? And I said, yes. And, you know, and I know it's the same kind of, that was probably my favorite sale. You know, I mean, an awful lot of what I think is particularly wonderful about working with artists and working with collectors is the passion, the sincerity, the shared ideas, you know, the growth that you get out of that. So by the time that Jeff, you and Linda met, how many works of art did you own? You know, I was kind of the, the natural collector of the two of us. Uh, I had, I probably had a dozen, at least a dozen, probably more than that if I look at all the, the prints and so forth. And yeah. this, when you had this manly man there, Linda, this was a real attraction, his artwork, his etchings. I think he literally invited me to his place to look at his etchings. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Thank Jeff. I'm proud you. of you, but I don't know what to Thank say. <laughs> yeah, your young artists don't even have, probably don't ascribe much meaning to that line. That was a pickup line back in the 50s and 60s. Oh, I think. Of course, the, et the etchings were of the erotic sort. I mean, mine weren't necessarily of the erotic sort. <laughs> but. Okay, cool. Well, and his art was influential in our connection. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was part of him, what I was interested in. And he had a fantastic, um, well, do you remember Yolanda, the uh, Paschke painting? Yeah. He owned that before I knew him. It's a, um, it's the best transvestite painting. It's the best one. Um, we always think that about what we have. Uh, and it was right there. We walked in the door and there she was. Uh, so did, that's cool. So Linda, did the you fit you fit the you fit the uh, epiphany? Did it take? Did you start looking at art on a regular basis from that time? Yes, I did. Um, so that was a, it was a junior in high school. So through my senior year, I was at the Art Institute a lot more, 
And then I went to New York to, for college, and that was like four years of art looking. Well, and you got a, uh, a master's in art history. Yeah, we're studying art history, not studio art. And what, what, okay, what, art, what period of art history did you focus on? For your, for your, uh... Well, modern was my field, but modern to them was 1789 on. Both of the Horatii and everything else. So that was. I can, uh, I, I can almost art. guess what school you went to from that description. Really? Were you in New York City or out, out, uh -huh. out of, you, you were north? No, I was at the Institute of Fine Arts. Okay. Um, I think the definition's gotten tighter <laughs> since then. All right. So <laughs> this, all right, now, how long have – I don't want to get too personal. How long have you guys been a couple? Um, over 20 years. And how long have you been collecting art? You, hold, you never stopped, I guess. No, not really. The, the and, problem we, when we slowed down – was when we have no more wall space. And we try to rotate the art, but you know, we get lazy and don't rotate as much, as often. And where we live now, the walls aren't as conducive to changing the art. So uh, we have art that we don't see anymore. So kind of well, a problem. Well, and, and when you're flush with money, there are periods of time when you're making more money where you've got more expendable cash to spend on art too. So so that's really an effect. I find that yeah. I mean, both of us you to a less extent, but my house has a lot of windows and it has a lot of small walls. There's a, there's a nice restraint. I mean I buy more art but more of it is smaller, you know, and I don't know, I don't think I own but one well, I can think of three pieces that are over twenty four by eighteen inches. And you know, there's probably 40 that are that size or smaller. And you guys are a bit that same kind of way. So when you are in the art buying phases of your relationship, are there guidelines or rules? I mean, do you discover the art together? Do you write checks together? Does one person pay for it? Do both people pay for it? I got more, but that's full of those for starters. <laughs> um, by and large, we agree. We, we decide to agree. Uh, there have been times when that was a mistake, but 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 it's uh, but yeah. By and large, we agree, and we have a very similar aesthetic. Well, that's we're, the thing. You're you're talking about. To... We're, we're always surprised at how much like if there's a room of art, we'll both like the same thing. Yeah, we'll sometimes play the game. Okay, which one of these pieces do you like the that's best? Cool. And we usually have the same. It's usually the same piece. Which is the I feel like they're on some kind of game show right now where, you know, it's like truth or consequences. And, you know, I'm asking Jeff a question and watching Linda react <laughs> and vice versa. Was that the wedding, the dating game, or the newlywed game? The newlywed game? Oh, yeah. Who was that? Alex Trebek? I don't remember. I shouldn't even know that I know that much. Um, all right. And... So, do you ever do you ever buy art over on time? Have you ever? Do you ever? Hardly, in, no, not hardly ever anymore. No. Is that a philosophical thing that you don't? I mean, I've had collectors who refuse. I've had three, well, several, um, but one is where I only pay. You know, I pay for it all at once, or I don't buy it. Um, another one is. Um, I'm paying for six pieces at other galleries over time already. Can I put this on hold for for six months and then I'll start paying it in December? Um, and um, you know, and then I would always be interested in giving people the artwork as soon as I had any money because I wanted to get rid of the chance of hurting it. And you know, some and a lot of people wouldn't want the art until it was paid for in full. And that spectrum, you guys are sort of like we want to pay within what we can afford to pay, and we'll pay for it at one time. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what we do. We'll, we'll, Why is we Linda shaking her head no, but she's going to say yes? Is no, no, I wasn't. Uh, are, are you looking for Discord, Paul? <laughs> no, I just saw it, but I wasn't looking for it. No thanks. Um, okay. No, we do. I wouldn't. If we we're buying something really huge, maybe we consider it. Yeah, if we found and found something, uh, Linda's definition of 
what we need to own. Her definition of art, which comes from some famous writer, is something that's life enhancing. If it's something that's truly life enhancing and it speaks to both of us really strongly, uh, yeah, we'd probably figure out a way way to buy it within reason. Okay, cool. I can't let this life enhancing notion go by without asking you to define what that means because you know I, the reason I'm going here is because I think I mean the artists in this course are between like 30 and 75 ish and um, I don't think most artists appreciate the passion that most collectors bring you know and one of the questions I heard earlier was you know a lot of galleries don't introduce their the collectors to the artist whose work that they're buying most artists don't know who own their artwork and they don't get enough feedback. I mean, so, you know, I mean, they're pouring their heart and soul into it, and you're talking about something being life-changing, um, which sounds really commensurate and appropriate and beautiful, but I want to know what you mean by that. Well, I mean, you can go to a gallery and you can look at something, um, and you'll take something away from it, but when you live with something, I think you get something different because you see it in different moods, different times of the day, so different light, um, different times of your life, you know, for over years you see it. And really good art, kind of, you know, I, I, for me, the mark of something that's really good is when I can still see new things years later. And when I cease to see anything, then it goes in the closet. But we can usually, I think we usually figure that out up front. Or if you don't oh, get pretty good yeah, guess, pretty yeah. good guess at it. You know what? You know you're right when you can still see all that stuff. You know, when I had a gallery, I talked about selling art or people buying art that they aspired to. You know, and that it should be a learning and spiritual experience that may rise to the occasion, and that life enhancing, or I would feel like it makes me a better person. Same kind of notion. And over time, in theory, you know, for many of the works of art, you should you should become their equal. And then probably it's time to find something else that renews that kind of experience. And Jeff, I think I interrupted you. What were you saying? No, no, I, I don't think you did. Okay. Um, I mean, life can be different. It can be different things. You know, does it make you? Some things make you just happy. Some things remind you of other things, or some things, like you say, kind of make you want to be a better person. Um, so it can be a lot of different things. And what's, I think, kind of crazy about Jeff and me is that we agree on what those things are somehow. Paul, I agree with you about the um, about galleries making their artists available to collectors. Uh, we've got a lot of artist friends, as you know. Um, right. And it's... Other than lot, we bought, we bought lots of art without knowing or even having ever met the artist. But it's nice, it's nice to be able to have a conversation with an artist at an opening or something and find out what's really underlying uh, the picture and their motivations. But I've also had the opposite problem of liking the art when I meet the person, not liking the person as much, <laughs> and so it kind of changes my feeling about the art. I mean, it's just, I mean, can't like everybody. Um, so it, it can go both ways. But I have always been uncomfortable with the notion that, you know, if an artist, if I have somebody's piece, they should know where it is. Yeah, I think so too. And I also think you guys do really well at uh, having a lot of artist friends and socializing with them. And I come to a once a year party, um, the winter solstice at your home, and there are I don't know. I, a lot of the reason I come is because of the artists that you invite, and who, some of whom I know and some of whom I want to know better. Um, I think that's really nice. I think you do that more than any other collectors I can think of. Yeah, and it's actually, it, it, I don't want to overstate the importance in terms of the collecting part, because it's really, it's not really connected directly to our collecting efforts. We've got a lot of artist friends that we have independent as friends and whose art we don't own. They're just the interesting people we meet. They kind of are, aren't they? That's why I love doing this course is because I you know I get to work with all these really interesting people. Um do you buy art on vacation? 
on occasion on vacation, yes. Uh, in fact, we have we bought one. This is kind of weird. We have a beautiful Julia Fish painting. Do, do Paul, do you remember it? It's a it's a mirror on a brick wall. So it's a white uh, painted white brick wall and a part of her mirror from her uh, bathroom, and it's just it's gorgeous. But we bought it in New York because we saw it there. We, it was at Feature, no, not Feature. Who was um. Lance and? What's her name? Um, went to New York. Lance Kins. And yeah. Well, it was, it was anyway, five. they were showing her and I don't I don't remember. Yeah. That's okay. But um, we and, we, and one one of the reasons I think we were drawn to it, there had been a there was a big Devoncord retrospective in New York at the time, which we had just seen. And when you looked at a small, and you looked at a detail, when you looked at the edge of this mirror painted on this wall, the subtle little lines that comprise the mirror, which becomes, in this case, it's not the least bit transparent, it becomes an object, looked like a demon coin to me. And I, so I, that probably, you know, juiced me up and made me want to, made me want to own it. That wasn't so we bought, bought something. Pardon me? Go ahead. We also bought something by a Chicago artist from a Berlin dealer at the Chicago Art Expo. So it gets, gets confusing. It was Dan Peterman at a Berlin gallery was shown here, and we happened to see it there. Yeah. Like to buy it more directly, but. That's where it was. Dan hasn't had a show. This is an interesting example for these artists. This is a Chicago artist. I don't know. When, when did Dan have a museum show in Chicago? But I don't know that he's had a gallery show in at least 20 years. Do you? Yeah. He's had a couple of shows at the Smart. Right. No gallery show. Well, not a gallery. That's not a, a gallery. No, show. that's not a gallery. No, you're right. Yeah, I don't think he has a Chicago gallery. He's I don't one think of so either. He's, yeah, but he's been really one of successful. Better known in Europe. In Europe. Here. I did an appraisal for a piece of his recently for some folks that I was surprised at how high the value was. So, you know, um, that's a good example, though, of an artist, you know, of an artist who's from somewhere and doesn't show there. And, you know, part of what we were saying earlier was that I don't, I don't think artists need, you know, you don't need to start at home and grow outward. You can start wherever, you know, there's people that are the right match for your artwork. Um, yeah. Can you describe your collection? I mean, I have a sense, and I'm hearing things, but I would like you to verbalize. You're open? Well, <laughs> there's no rhyme or reason to media. We, it, it, we never pay attention. We don't do just one thing. Um, we have painting, sculpture, prints. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in fiber art, so we have a we have quilt. Um, and Donna, is that the world I know you from? I think I know yep. Donna Hapak from the uh, Textile Art Center. I'm just seeing her picture. She looks very familiar. Yep, she is. Um, She's, you're right. She, and, uh, I, like, I like to say it's eclectic, which is an overused <laughs> word, but it, it and it, it 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 reflects what appeals to us at the time. And we were, we're not out there try, consciously trying to put together a collection uh, that James Rondo is going to court us for or something like that. We're not trying to build um, a specific focus. So that we're basically buying this stuff, you know, the stuff you can't live without. That's beautiful. I think that's how it's supposed to be, you know. I mean, I think if you're buying it for somebody else, you know, or with investment in mind or somebody else, then you're buying it with somebody else's taste. Or for some right. that just seems like ridiculous. We're kind of, you know, I mean, maybe that's what you do with a stock portfolio, but I don't think that's what you do with art artwork. Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, I used to work in an art gallery. I used to work at Perimeter Gallery, and I, we would get people like that, and that was hard to sell, too. I mean, you know, if, if I like the art, when someone's just looking for investment, to talk about it like that was actually, I don't think that approach. 
And I've, I don't know, I've recommended to people in this group, I can recommend, there's a fabulous book by Michael Finley called The Value of Art. And it's just a really wonderful read. And he is one of those high-powered art dealers who sells art for millions and millions of dollars. And um, he talks about how he wishes his, the people he sells to were really, you know, you guys. And that kind of motivation. It's, it's really fascinating. And he breaks it down into three different, you know, reasons to participate in art um, as a collector. I found it a really wonderful book. Um, I want to open this up to you guys, how the artists, and let you ask questions in a second. It sounds, though, that most of the art you are buying is by Chicago artists. It is. Not not exclusively, but, but it's just the way it's the art we see most, most of. Um, and most of it is by Chicago artists. It's, you know, it's the art we hear about, people tell us to go see shows, and some of it is by our friends. Um, it seems accessible. It's, we're not setting out to be Chicago. I mean, I could see that would make sense for somebody, but it's, that's not our, the point. Um, but, but I like that. I like that aspect of it. And I'm aware of being a supporter of the Chicago arts. I mean, it always feels good to be able to buy something. I think it makes more artist. sense you know, to, to do at least a, a portion of your buying at home um, and support your, you know, the, it comes back that if you're raising the level of the pond, I think, it, you know, you help somebody else in your own neighborhood, it comes back to help you. My neighborhood, I mean the whole entire city. Um, do you ever sell or give away art that you've purchased? We have. We, we, we've we never sold a piece. I don't think we've ever sold a piece. Um, there are a couple pieces right now we're contemplating selling. Uh, but we have given, I have given away, we have given away some artwork for a charitable deduction. Jeff is much more of a collector than I am, and I'm willing to give things up more quickly than he is. So if it were up to me, we would sell more than we do, but you like to have it. But have, I you ever, maybe have you ever purchased from um, auction? Yes. From what? Auction. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, early on, when I was, I guess, still before I came to Chicago, I uh, took a few trips up to uh, New York and, and bought at Park Burnett, uh, the predecessor of Sotheby's, and uh, it was fun. Um, I was buying, you know, 1920s and 1930s uh, etchings and, and dry points. And most of them have like quintupled in in price since I bought them, um, but it was fun to do. And I have I happen to know a dealer in Washington who sort of turned me on to it. But we also buy things at the you know benefit auctions, and I know artists are asked so much for stuff that I I kind of feel guilty about it sometimes. But but your students should know that we have often been introduced to an artist by buying something at auction, at one of those benefit auctions, you know, for $100 or, you know, $500 or, in fact, I remember you and Paul, we were had in a bidding war for something once, um, the Joe Hormuz print at the High Park Art Center. You must have won. Um, yeah, we, we did. did. <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember it. <laughs> I'm, I, I know I don't own pieces of hers. <laughs> Mm. But my point yeah. is that we we have been introduced found artists that we like <laughs> through those, so they are sometimes worthwhile. I I don't know about for everybody. For us, they. Yeah, well, all right, Jeff. So where are all those etchings that you bought at uh, Park Bernay back in the old days? So, so where are they now? Correct. Do you have them. Or they're gone. I do. No, I have them. They're all matted. They're in a nice archival case. Um, there are a couple, some of them that have been framed. Uh, I should now we do rotate our art in our house at least once a year, sometimes more. So you know, I may you know who knows I may bring out and do a wall of you know of prints from that era on one wall. You know, one one day. Are they American or European? Pardon me. 
I'm right. interested in Linda's question. Well, I was going to say the things that I don't like, there, there are some things that we disagree on. They tend to be end up in his office. <laughs> Good. And my office at work. Yeah. I got it. All right. Who's got questions? One, that's one. There's Donna. Donna, we're going to go with Donna. That's a good place to start. Okay, Donna, go. Wait a minute. I'll unmute you. I'll try to. He's undoing you. Why can't I unmute Donna? John, I'm going to do you. There, John, you go. Oh, Donna, wait, John, time out. Donna, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, hi, Linda. Nice to see you and to hear you talk about this. Um, do you, when you collect, do you collect, do you buy from only from galleries or and, and auctions or how do you collect? Hmm. Buy directly from artists? Mostly galleries. Yeah, mostly galleries. But I'm not, that's not a, that's probably the easiest way to do it. And also because I worked in a gallery, I'm, Kind of aware of the difficulty of buying directly from artists. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time we did want to buy directly, and I called the gallery <laughs> to find out if it was okay. Because <laughs> that can be really messy if you sell directly to a collector and the, for the gallerist, that can be yeah. problematic. So uh, that's probably why we do it mostly through galleries. Uh, what about, what about artists have, who don't have galleries? What about that? I don't. Th I don't think we hesitate to buy directly from them, but it hasn't happened very often. Because, um, Where's the opportunity? I mean, it's, it's hard. Yeah, we have to have an invitation to the studio, or we very hard. Of course, one of the it's probably the important issue that you're talking about tonight. Without a gallery, it's hard for the world to see see the work. So we're just. Just not aware. Although we bought from things like, you know, around the coyote directly. No, that's true. That's direct, right? Totally. Yeah. No, so that's, I guess, the question I asked that. Do you go to alternative spaces? Yes, we do. Um, that the MW uh, show that was, we had two of them now. One was good, yeah, one MDW. was good. Yeah. MW, right. right. Love that, and I was really surprised that there were so few collectors there. That was that was not good. I tried um, to get them there. I got a few, and then they, some of them rolled their eyes, and some of them loved it. I, it, it has been a really yeah. good show. Um, Donna, did you have more questions? No, that was it. Thanks. Okay, thank you too, John. Your turn. Go ahead, John. So thank you both. I think this has been really um, it's it's um, very very sincere. Um, the comments you've made, um, and as an artist, I think you know we're often trying to figure out how we can communicate ourselves, communicate our work, what's going on inside us, and how we can get to people. It's 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 kind of funny, you know, looking looking at a uh, at a screen. It's, it's like the other side of the mirror, you know. And you, you you said something to me that was just so poetic. Something that is life enhancing will find a way to buy it. Um, and I mean, that's kind of humbling as an artist. And I have a few folks that have really, I mean, they, they've paid me $50 twice a month until they could pay it off. Um, but, uh, and that's just, I mean, that's just kind of humbling. Can you talk a little bit about maybe a couple pieces? And when you say life enhancing, why those pieces affected you? And, and you know, maybe pieces that you've had for an extended period of time um, how, you know, you talked about looking at them, at them through different times in your life. Can you talk a little bit about that? Good one, John. Thank you. Well, the, the first one that came to mind is a painting that I bought at an art expo when I was, I was really early on. It was by a, a Manuela Sedmak. Never heard of her again. She was Italian. And... Uh, it's a painting of, it's very dark, it looks like a, maybe a fire, a campfire with chairs around it. And it's, 
it's almost kind of like operatic in its drama. And when I look at it in certain at certain times, it's scary. Um, and it's kind of thrilling because it's scary. Um, and other times, it's you look at a, something that's scary and you know that you can overcome that. So it reminds you of that. I mean, it's kind of hard to put in words exactly what, how that would affect you. Um, but those, are, those were the two things that came to mind when you said that. Life enhancing. Not necessarily like, oh, I'm happy now. I, we could probably talk about it with, with a dozen, uh, apply that standard to a dozen or more things we own. Uh, but I think it's going to be different for every collector. Um, and Linda and I do tend toward the dark, darker, more difficult art. Uh, we had, uh, I, I had this funny thing that I sometimes say, I say, well, it's just too pretty. Um, and for us, art sometimes can be uh, too pretty. Uh, so, but that's going to be different for that's going to be different for every collector. Do you go visit other other collectors? Do you go on tours? Do they do you open your house up? We 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 haven't opened our house up. We've we've been members of the uh, contemporary art uh, contemporary art society. Um, at the Art Institute for many for many years, and so we've gone on many of these uh, tours of collections. Yeah, no, it's always interesting. To yeah, tours, yeah, tours of private collections are all are fascinating to see. But they're much bigger collections than ours. I mean, with big names. So I mean, our collection isn't. I wouldn't think something that someone would come and tour. We love it, but I don't think not on the tour yet. <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't want their collections either. Uh, I've seen a couple I'd like. <laughs> well, <at least. laughs> okay. There's also, you know, there's the life enhancing things that you can't get. Like that Richard Serra would really change our lives, but we can't get that one. Which Richard Serra? Just that one? Any Richard Serra. <laughs> <laughs> get okay, cool. Prince. Yeah, John said get one of his prints. They're pretty big too. I want one of those really greasy ones. You know, the, the ones that have like poop on the surface. That would be great. Oh, good, Anna. I've been, I've been wanting to call on Anna, but I don't want to put her on the spot. Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for talking to us tonight. It's wonderful to get a collector's or two collectors' perspective. Um, what is it like as a collector to follow the course of an artist's work over an extended period of time, say 20 years now? Is there anyone that you've followed? And what is it like to see their work change? You know, do you mourn the passing of a certain body of work? Or is it exciting? Um, just what's your experience with that? Well, the person that came to mind right away is uh, Karen Reimer, is someone that we've collected in depth. Uh, we knew her from, there was this, I don't know if any of you remember the, the, what were the Uncomfortable Spaces galleries. Uh, they were kind of a loose network of some alternative galleries. And Karen, we first saw her there, and we followed her as she moved around to the gallery. Um, and it's always it's so exciting to see what her new show is going to be. Uh, she's so uh, innovative in something that, how does she do it? How does she find new stuff to do? Uh, so that's actually a great joy. But it also happens that we've had things by people, and then either they just disappear, which is, that's okay, but it would have been nice to, you know, have them continue to make art. But sometimes they go in a direction that you don't like. And I, yeah. just, I want to spell Reimer. Isn't Reimer R H E I M E R? R E I M E R. There's no H? No. Okay, R E I M E R. He's a really wonderful artist and a very 
intelligent woman who uses domestic materials and issues in her artwork. Um, and, and, she and should be a superstar. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. She should be a superstar. Yeah, I agree. No, well, I'm curious though, which uncomfortable space, which gallery was that? Do you remember? Who's that? Who's it uh, Beret International. Beret International. Karen Chenevere, yeah. Yeah. Wow, I don't know if I remember that. That's cool. I didn't realize that. All right. Fabulous. Um, Anna, did you want to... We have also, well, we have also bought pieces. Um, I don't want to be too dark talking to a bunch of young artists, but we've also bought pieces from an artist who just seemed like the hottest thing in Chicago. And then he just stops making art. This sculpture oh, yeah. we bought David from... Cotker? David you remember Cotker? David Cocker? Yeah, I do remember David. Yeah. And he was, we thought it was going to be something special. And then he started making, doing tattoos. And <laughs> we never heard from him again. And yeah. that kind of put the stamper on the piece that we had that we're so excited about. Because part of when you're collecting is that you are, you know, helping along. So you buy something when someone's young and so they can continue. I mean, not the only reason to do it, but no, if they don't continue, there's kind of a dead end that's uncomfortable. But you, you do pay attention vicariously to most of the living artists whose work you still enjoy, right? Sure. And most of the artists who Jeff acquired, the past dead artists, you pay attention to differently. Sure. I don't. <laughs> you don't have to pay attention at all. Okay, I don't pay attention very close. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of vaguely aware of the, the value of these works, but, but I don't pay real close attention. These are pieces that I love, and I know, know a little bit about their historical value, and so they're just, they're just there for the duration. I think there's some intrinsic differences between buying um, horizontal artists as opposed to vertical artists. I gave a talk sometime oh, yeah. about dead and living, and somebody said, you mean horizontal and vertical artists? And I said, that's wonderful. So yeah, I think there's a difference between going after horizontal artists and vertical artists. I'll have to, I'll have to remember that. I don't think I've ever bought something by someone who's already horizontal. <laughs> nice euphemism, huh? <laughs> uh, but I think Jeff has, right, Jeff? Yes. All right. All right. Who's got more questions, folks? Sarah, Joe, we know you have questions. <laughs> All right. Wait a minute. Who's that? Is that Ann? Is it going to work, Ann? Go ahead. Ann, go ahead. Ann, start typing. <laughs> We had, she and I did a private session the other day to make it work, and now it's not happening. I'm putting it back no. on mute, and I'm sorry. Um, Liz has a comment or question. Go ahead, Liz. Um, I have a question. You had said how um, you mostly find the artists that you want to collect through galleries and things like that, but um, and you said, well, you know, if they're not from galleries, then they have to get in contact with you and send you something. Well, how do they get in contact and send you something? Well, that, yeah, that, that's sort of a catch-22. Uh, we do go to MFA shows, actually. We, we really, we've had fun at some MFA shows. Um, but then you'll spot somebody like at an MFA show, and we're probably not um, serious enough detectives to try to track them down at that point. I mean, or at least we haven't so far. Somebody who we liked at an MFA show that doesn't have gallery representation yet, and and reached out to try to find them. No, we haven't done that. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a problem. Yeah, and I guess I didn't mean to imply that I would want to be you know have people send me slides. I didn't mean that, um, but it's just hard to hook up. It's hard to find a the gallery is an easy way to do it, but we do pursue, you know, more of the temporary exhibitions, uh, which is a good way of meeting people. 
you guys have friends who don't who don't share your interest in art. Is that correct? <laughs> there we, are few. We do, yeah. Yeah, I've met them at parties. Um, yeah, some of them are no, hostile to it. Oh, some of them are at the parties. Yeah. We admit yeah. we interviewed them. I know. I found them. Um, <laughs> you were probably stunned. Yeah. And, and you think some of them, Linda, are hostile? They're hostile to contemporary art, yeah. They're you know, like my five-year-old could do it sort of thing. Yep. Um, and I love to get that comment. That's just, that's great, just a great starting point. I know. Do it. <laughs> I know. Where do we go from there? Sarah Jo, your turn. So my question, I also, uh, well, first, thank you so much. It's really wonderful to hear this sort of from collectors. It's wonderful to hear this, um, your discussion. Um, and I was also very uh, taken with the idea of the life enhancing art. And I'm curious if you have um, not these friends uh, uh, who don't appreciate contemporary art, but if you know other collectors, if you're friendly with other people who collect art, either as friends or just as acquaintances, who uh, feel similarly or who have a very different approach to how they collect, if, if, if you're collecting, uh, it, it reaches you. Um, or involve you with other people. I, I missed the uh, last part of that last night. Okay, so, um, so the question is um, your approach and, and a work of art being life enhancing is one way that it was described, um, which I loved is a way of talking about the kind of artwork that um, you're moved by or interested in. And do you have other acquaintances, other collectors that you know, do they feel very differently in the kind of work that they collect, or do they also share that kind of, um, yeah? You know, I think most, most serious art collectors do share that, although there's very many different ways of forming a collection. And there's some, we know some collectors that are very rational and talk to curators and they, you know, they do an immense amount of due, due diligence because they're trying to collect museum quality pieces. Uh, and maybe that takes a little bit of the uh, personal euphoria out of it. I would think it does. But for them, that's the way they approach it. Um, but I think the collecting community is a pretty passionate one in terms of uh, focusing on stuff that really gets them excited. I don't want to. I don't want to put other collectors down just because they don't share my uh, eclectic taste. I think we're probably a little more casual about our collection than a lot of people are. Um, like, you know, something we live with rather than something we have. So, in a sense, you're saying. No. <laughs> I just went out. <laughs> Sandwich probably no, didn't work. It is. Okay. <laughs> um, it, so, you you're collect more from a, a kind of gut reaction um, than a kind of marketing, um, you know, this investment yeah. strategy, I suppose. Okay. Actually, my, my real um, test for if we need to buy something is um, if I wake up the next morning thinking about it, not like 10 minutes, not five minutes, if I wake up thinking about it, I'm absolutely sure. And, and that's been a really good um, indicator. Yeah, no, that, okay. yeah that, that, that does work. I can't speak for other people. <laughs> Cool. Anne, Anne, who is having trouble with her microphone equipment, asked, she says she has friends who collect a certain artist, and that the, one of the artists recently said he was going to Venice and was going to do a series of 10 paintings and asked if they would like to pre-buy one, as long as they got the right of refusal. And or, you know, I've heard of situations similar to this. Or I've heard of somebody, what Anne wants to know is if you've encountered things like this. Um, but I've also heard of situations where sculptors are doing an addition of um, 
three and you buy, you know, you buy one at a, I don't know, 40, 50 percent discount, you get your, you know, you get the first piece and it's, it's enough to pay for the other thing cast. Have you ever been involved in anything along these lines? We're we're aware we're also we're aware of you know these, these kind of practices happen. And I think they're I think they're perfectly fine. I don't know that we've ever uh, pre-ordered. I had bought wine. I had bought Bordeaux futures, but I never bought art futures. <laughs> I'd hate to buy painting I hadn't seen yet. What about that Four Brothers portfolio? Oh, I actually it was the very first thing. I Linda's making a liar out of me. This was a little different. There was a portfolio of 10 lithographs by, by Four Brothers Press. This was 20 years ago. Uh, and each each print was by a different Chicago artist. It was actually one by Paschke, and there was... Uh, I, yeah, there were a, a lot of terrific printmakers and painters. Um, and so I paid for the whole portfolio up front before any of them were printed. And it was a great fun for me. This was a real introduction in Chicago art too, because I would go to the I would go to the studio where these prints were being made. And uh each time they were ready, they'd call me up and I'd come by and pick it up. And you could smell the ink and he'd explain to me what a blend roll was and so forth that might have been used in one of the prints. And, so, but that's a little, that's probably a little different from what the questioner was really getting at. We have um, participated in the Hyde Park Art Center uh, program where you work with an artist directly to uh, commission a piece. And I love that idea. That was, that was terrific. We didn't, we didn't do it a second time, but um, for no not for a good reason, Paul. Um, I did it once and not again, but yeah, I know. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. It was fun. So well, I, I love the commissioning. Oh, yeah. Anybody, I, I've got people with hands up, but there are people who have already asked questions. I don't know if you didn't put them down or you have another question. If you have a question, unmute yourself and ask it. This is John. I no, I, had to, I had to follow up with the Richard Sarah comment. Um, because he's one of my he's he's one of my um, one of my favorites. Um, what what piece were you so moved by? Of course, his stuff is it can get a little pricey. But what what uh, what were you looking at? What can you describe what you were looking at? What what Richard Sarah work were you talking about? Is it like the the forty foot piece in in the, in the um, turnaround in in Luxembourg, or was it something a little smaller? Well, there's a really Great one in Dallas, outside the Kimball, I think. It was huge. Yeah. I mean, oh, this is yeah, yeah. way beyond anything it could possibly. Um, yeah. well, there's one in St. And the one in St. Louis at the uh, Pulitzer uh, Foundation. Have you seen that one? Yeah. That's no, I haven't seen that one. No, no. Really walked the Kimball, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, the you drawing would definitely be uh, instead of, but even that, that, those are hugely expensive. I think those but they're gorgeous. They're just, you know, I think he's one 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 sculptor who's been able to take his concepts and transition them in, in, into prints very nicely. It's it's they're wonderful. But I, I I was just curious. I didn't I didn't know if he'd made smaller pieces that you'd seen in somebody's like home that you'd gone through or something like that, or if it was one of the large pieces that are just breathtaking. What a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys ever give art as a gift? We do. We do. It's very really tricky. To whom? Yeah, we do. Family or friends or are, are you giving wedding, wedding, wedding gifts? Gift. Yeah, I I like that idea because it's um, personal. It's something that uh, a young couple doesn't have, and sometimes and it's we usually find something that's slightly thematic, love. Yeah. Um, but, and I don't know how it's gone over. We're not quite sure. So but these, are things are things really hard. these are things you've gone out and acquired, not just something that you go, well, Jeff, we haven't seen this one in a long time. Why don't we give it away? 
We no, there's things that were in our collection. Um, they were. Mm -hmm. But you know, I had this one thing, and I was like, oh no, we we loved it. This would make a great wedding gift, and I had to wait for the right couple. Um, and that's cool. Like, oh. mm -hmm. And do you ever get gifts of art? Rarely. No. What do you want to give us? Oh, you know, I've given, <laughs> I've lent, I've lent, you know, as I've moved into a house with a lower ceiling, I lent something that I couldn't hang to somebody else, and they've had it now for eight years. And I've seen, it reproduced, I've seen it reproduced in magazines, um, and I get the feeling it's never coming back, or I'm never going to get it again. Wow. Okay, is there some law about that? We we have done the same thing. We've loaned a number of pieces to, to Linda's sister and brother in law. Um, there was some other Which is great because then I can actually see them. Things that we didn't have room yeah. for and they put them on their wall. I, I love that idea. As long as uh, I don't know, nothing happens to them. What was that? No. So far so good. I can't think of the other thing I was gonna say. Are there things on your horizon that you'd like to buy? Or like, you know, are there artists that you would like to own? You know, we recently got lucky and bought a Theaster Gates uh, ceramic piece uh, before he exploded in the last 12 months. Um, you know, he's now got representation in London, and I overheard that some of his pieces are going for sixty thousand dollars now. Uh, wow. And I, I, I think I bought we, we bought this piece actually at the Hyde Park Art Center. Um, something I, I don't know that there's anything I'm particularly coveting or have my eye on it now. I actually I coveted oh, his do. um his actually the actors he did this uh, series of white porcelain pieces up at Kohler and he was yep. at the residency at Kohler and he did the he displayed them apart that like toilet seats that were beautiful. It, it was at the MZW Fair. Is that right? No, it had to be at Arctic. No, they were at the Art Fair. And, uh, yeah, they were at the... I saw them there. Um, I, um, for those of you who don't know Theaster Gates' work, you should look them up. First name's Theaster, last name Gates, G-A-T-E-S. Um, and he did a webinar with us, and it's on the list, and I'll send it to you guys, Jeff and Linda also. Because it was it was really a special evening, this webinar, um, and he's a wonderful guy. But yeah, there are people who I cover whose work I'm really you know would like to. Oh, well, it's wonderful when you see somebody like that who does achieve mammoth success because it is so rare. It's such I, I admire everybody that you're doing this seminar with because they've got you got to have so much courage to. To make a career out of making art, because it's just so hard and so competitive. There's so many talented artists out there, um, and every once in a while, somebody who who's really good gets gets just the push they need or the support they need, uh, and really really soars. You know, every time I see the Astor and I go, "How you doing?" You know what he says? He says, "Super good." Yeah. Well, he's being honest. Yeah, he is. <laughs> I, the, the question about what we're, is there anything like kind of on the horizon? There are artists that I follow that I would like to get something someday, like I'm waiting for the right painting or, the, you know. How about Carolina? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, Carolina. Um, oh. and she's showing at Monique Maloche right now. She uses fiber. She teaches at the Art School of the Art Institute, the fiber artist. Natowski, something like that. I'll just um, look it up. Uh, I'll, I'll have it in a second. <laughs> okay. She, we saw her in our fair about a year ago. Oh, and Nat, Nat, Natowski. Yeah. Yeah. Last name G N A T O W S K I. The first name's Carolina with a K. And she has some pieces up at Lula's Cafe right now that are spectacular. If anyone wants to go out to dinner, it's, they're really nice. So we have a piece on hold right now that um, we want to, we don't know if we want that piece because it might be small. And she talks about how she makes these um, 
uh, pieces to really be tapestries, and tapestries were for uh, insulating. And so this piece is too small to play that role, and I wonder if it's going to look too insignificant um, in terms of that. So they're going to bring it over to the house and see how it looks. Where is this piece now? At the restaurant or the gallery? The gallery. And when they bring it to the house, how long will it be there? I don't know. We haven't negotiated that. Okay. Sometimes a gallery will need it. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they'll leave it and you can live with it for a while. We don't do that. Um, but I know that some people have that, have that done. Uh, or I was just envisioning them coming over and, you know, seeing what would it look like on this wall. Right. Uh, in this space. Yeah, I want to be responsible for it if I don't own it. I don't want to have it in the house. Yeah, um, I know. I feel that's my good. dog ate it. <laughs> Do you ever make a choice to consciously push yourself out of your comfort zone when you're looking at work um, or considering what you might buy? I know for myself when I'm viewing work or, or purchasing work, I have a tendency to go to similar themes and um, feelings and, you know, I have to watch that I don't um, constrict, you know, my viewpoint. And I'm just wondering if you ever push yourself or have to push yourself to look a little broader or not. I, I think we do. Um, we, we both like avant work, so, and we both like a little edgier, kind of grittier work. Although it, it's easy to fall into that, you know, that subset, uh, so that you're not looking at something that's not so gritty but, but challenging in a different way. So it's hard to know for sure. I, I think we do. I, I think we both do challenge our, our uh, ourselves on that front. Well, we go to a, a lot of museum shows, um, so we're always looking at art, and so just as anyone would, would hope, we're growing as people in our relationship to art. So I think just by educating ourselves, that's that's a challenge to, it, because it changes the way that we look at what we collect. And are you still surprised sometimes by things that you love? I mean, are you like surprised that you would be drawn to something? Absolutely, sure. <laughs> Carolina is a great example. I always thought, you know, knitted stuff, really? <laughs> and I love it. It, it, it. Her work it transcends craft, and it would be very easy to fall into a craft kind of look, but it's also about weaving. Uh, and it's, it's somewhat, it's got orifice, orifices, so it's also got a little edgy aspect to it, so. Mm. Do you think we should be challenging ourselves in a certain way? Oh, no, I don't have any preconception about what you should be doing or what you shouldn't be doing. I was just curious. Since you've been doing it so long and it seems like it's so important to you, it brings so much to your lives, I was just curious about your process. I guess I don't pay that much attention to my process. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Lin Linda by temperament hates to do the same thing twice. So, I I hope that doesn't get me in trouble later this evening. <laughs> but no, so only one. Only one. Next, what I was saying. But so. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think we're both, we're both temperamentally oriented that way. Maybe it hurts a little more than me. Maybe. Cool. I think we should stop. All right. I think. I think this has been really informative. I think you've shown that you guys are genuine, alive, human, passionate collectors, and that you know art fits into your life and determines and shapes it to an extent, and that you you know make a difference and give back. Um, I think it's already wonderful. Let me unmute everybody so that in unison or you know, whack thereof we can all say thank you. Linda, Jeff, thank you both very very much. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Heidi, good night all. Thanks very much. Good night. Thank you all. Bye-bye.